speaks about the second mile. And if you have your Bible with you this morning, Matthew 5, 41, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word, and then be ready to turn to the book of 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Say it with me this morning. And whoever compels you to go with him one mile, go with him two. Turn, if you will, to 1 John, fourth chapter this morning. And we've been talking on going the second mile about serving, giving, and loving. And we understand that we seek the approval of our master, desire the passion of his ministry, and to stay focused on Jesus, going a second mile. Putting this all together today, the foundation for going that second mile is exactly what we've been teaching for the last three weeks. Serving. It takes a servant to go a second mile. Giving. It compels us beyond ourselves to give of ourselves to go a second mile. But this morning, loving. The love of God that compels us to go a second mile. If you will, look in 1 John, 4th chapter this morning, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of the Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God... God abides in him, and he is in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, and because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God this morning. And we thank you for what you have taught us in love. The teaching of our master is true. And love compels us to go a second mile, to see far beyond the first mile. Father, I pray this morning that the body of Christ would receive the word of God that you have for them today. And today we would give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Love is one of our favorite subjects, one of our favorite topics when it comes to the church, when it comes to who we are in Christ, what we are in Christ. It is love. It's actually been said this way. Accurately, the Word of God teaches us this, that love does not define God, but God defines love. Love does not define God. It's God who defines what love is. Much of what we call love in our modern society bears no resemblance or relationship to the holy spiritual love of God. Love is a valid test Love is a valid test of our fellowship with one another, our sonship with God. If you're truly born of God, you know that love will not be a forced response. 
It will be a natural response because that's what's in you. The love of God's in you. God's nature lives and resides in you. This is the nature of God of which has changed our life and taken up residence in our life and best described in the Word of God, abides in us. Abides. Think about that word for just a moment because in this world, we generally will tell somebody, I love you. But yet, do we often mean all those words? Love sometimes is cheap in our society. In our modern day, we can tell somebody we love them, and it won't be soon after that. We might not even like them at all. But that's not the love that God talks about. God's love is constant, never changing, perfect in who He is and what He does in us. That love abides in us, changing us, changing the nature in us because before we knew God, we really did not know love at all. It is the love of God that changed us because the nature of God came to rule and reign in us and that nature abides abides in us and that's the nature that changed us. It's the nature of God that took up residence in our life and abides with us forever, that has forever impacted us and changed us our view of everything. Now, folks, the law will tell you you're to go one mile. Anyone can do that. But Jesus was setting a foundation for his disciples and the church to go a second mile, to go beyond what man could do, to in the supernatural, powerful realm of God, love compels us to go further. Love takes me beyond one mile to the second mile. Love changes my teaching, changes my aspect, changes how I look upon my brother, changes how I look upon God. The nature of God's love changes me forever. And that word that he talks about in loving here is a complete passage that John has written to us, letting us know that God changed us when he saved us and brought us into his family, that now his love abides in us. And because his love abides in us, there's some things that we need to get from this word this morning. So let me show you some things from the word of God today that teaches us about loving on the second mile. First of all, the word of God talks about knowing, and it talks about knowing God through love. Since the nature of God is love, notice what the word of God says. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Think about that this morning, church. Verse 8 tells us in the word know, it teaches us our love grows through a personal relationship with God. I know the love of God because He loved me. I didn't love God when I was lost. I didn't love God in sin. I didn't love God in the shackles and bondage of this world. I did not know the love of God. But God loved me. And the way we know this is, I want you to look at verse number 10 this morning. And if you will, notice the word that God gives us in this verse. It's the word propitiation. Propitiation. Do you know what that word means? That word means, according to to God, He sent His Son, His Son, to be the propitiation of our sin. It meant to appease, to satisfy To cover the penalty of our sin. That God loved us when we were unlovable. Sent His Son when we were, 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 had no hope of getting to Him. And became propitiation of our sin. Appeasing the wrath of God. Justifying us just as though we had never sinned. Because God loved us. The church, let me tell you what that means this morning. It means this. It means you cannot work to get to God. You cannot earn his salvation. You cannot be good enough. You cannot do enough good deeds. You cannot do enough good works. You can't be a good enough person to get to God. God came for us. There's a big difference in this word, church, and it's this. It means to appease, means to satisfy God when it comes to the penalty of sin. The sin mark 
the mark upon us that we had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, had no way to get to God. We were hopeless. We had no way to get to God. But God came to us, sending His Son that we may know Him, that we may know the power of His resurrection. First John writes to us to tell us that we might know Him. And it is God's love that compels us to come to Him, to know that we have been saved, to know that we have been forgiven. Think about it this morning, church, to know this morning as a child of God that I've been saved, that I have eternal security with God, to know I have been forgiven, to know this morning that my sin debt is paid in full, not because of what I've done, but because of what He's done. Knowing this morning that God's wrath upon my life was appeased because Christ took my sin debt, God forgave me. One of the great things about being a Christian is knowing I'm forgiven. Knowing that God's grace and God's mercy was ample enough to forgive me. To know that bondage of sin is no longer on my life. And that I have been adopted into the family of God when my nature was contrary to God. When my lifestyle was contrary to God. When my works were contrary to God. My deeds were contrary to God. He sent His Son and His love compelled compelled us to come to him to know that we have been forgiven, saved, and adopted into the family of God. Do you know what it means to be adopted? It means when nobody wanted you, God did. When we had nothing to offer, God had everything to offer. When we had no way to get to God, God came for us. When I had no work or deed or anything on me that made me, that, that made me approachable to God, His propitiation, His love compelled Him to adopt us into the family of God. Church, I'm adopted. I've got a new nature. I've got a new home. I've got a promise from God. I've got an eternity. I've got a, a, a reward. I've got all these promises based nothing on what I've done, but knowing what God did through His love. Amen, church? What compels me to go a second mile? The same thing I saw in that video that I wanted to tell you. The man said, I have been taught by my master to love, to go a second mile because I know God, because God changed my nature, and because He brought me into the family of God. Therefore, God has saved me, forgave me, adopted me, and blessed me for an eternal security with Him. To God be the glory. Amen. Now, the second thing you're going to know is this. Notice the words that He gave you here to know. And the Word of God did tell us in verse 8, He who does not love does not know God. If you have no love in you, you do not know God because God is love. But the Word next goes into verse 12 and says this, that we also see God through love. Now the biggest thing that you'll notice in verse 12 is that no one has seen God at any time. That means God in the total triune package. Nobody has seen God at any time. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We've seen the manifestation of God through Jesus Christ our Lord who came to this earth in the flesh and took our sin to a place called Calvary where there is an empty grave and now we know the sin debt has been paid in full. But one day we shall see God. Y'all okay? It's not today. Well, we don't know. Maybe it is. But no one has seen God, and he means in the total triune there. But we know this. We see God in things. Now watch what I mean by this. Years ago, Billy Graham was asked a question when it came to seeing the Holy Spirit. They say, how can you preach about something you cannot see? And he gave the ultimate response. He said, you cannot see the wind, but you can see the effects. I want to tell you something this morning, church. They may not see everything in our life of God, 
But they're seeing the effects of God on our life. Amen? They're seeing God's effect on our life. And what do I mean by that? I mean there's been change in our life because God's Word abides in us. God's love abides in us. God's family abides with us. God, Almighty God, is seen through His love in us. Now let me tell you what I mean by that, church. I mean this. No one has seen God at any time, yet we know God because He abides in us. Well, if He abides in us, then He ought to be seen through us. If the Holy Spirit of God abides in you, takes up residence in you, then what ought to be manifested is God living in your life that others would see Jesus in you. Lost people, the first Jesus they'll know is a Jesus they'll see in you. They'll see Christ living in your life. And let me tell you what I mean by this. You see, church, I believe there's some effects that happen on our life when the Spirit of God takes up residence in us, when God abides in us, there is a, first of all, love for His Word. When God abides in you, the Bible says in John 15, 7, my words abide in you. I'll tell you right now, the Word of God has a major impact on our life when we get saved. When the nature of God comes to live in you, the Word of God grows in you. The Word of God comes to live in you. And when the Word of God lives in you, the Word of God is going to have effect on you. Church, let me tell you something. You can tell when people are being affected by the Word of God because they become doers of the Word of God. You know what you saw in that video a minute ago? You saw a man who said, I have been taught to do something. But you saw a man who said, who took that teaching and did what he was called to do in that teaching. You know what the church needs to hear today? We don't need to just come and hear the Word of God. We need to hear the Word of God and do the Word of God. There should be, there should be an effect of God's Word on our life because God's Word abides in us. God's Word changes us. God's Word is living, manifested among us. God's Word has changed my life, indwelt my life, filled my life, filled it with His Word. There's a love for God's Word when you get saved. Let me tell you something, Christian. Listen to this. I find few Christians who are truly born again who are debating God about His Word. They're abiding in His Word. The Word of God tells us if we love God, we'll we'll obey His commandments. The Word of God tells us if we love God, His Word will abide in us. And so if His Word abides in us, we are seeing God's love through His Word that's been manifested in our life. Another thing you're going to see is this. You're going to see a love for His church. Let me tell you what I mean by that, church. I mean this. You'll notice in verse number 7, the very first word is the word beloved. The word beloved is written to the brethren, to the family of God, to the children of God. You'll notice what the Word of God tells us. We are to love one another. We can't hate our brother. We're to love our brother. The Bible says if we hate someone, we're a liar, and the love of God does not exist in us. So therefore, the body of Christ is a body of love. We are a family of love. We're a family that's been drawn together by God. Therefore, we ought to have a love for one another, which means a love for His church. And let me tell you this. You can't sit and say you love God and hate the church He died for. You can't say I love God and hate His bride. Let me tell you what that'd be. That'd be like you telling me, well, I love you, but I don't love your wife. Well, that would be offensive unto me. How offensive do you think it would be to God that we would say, God, we love you, but we don't love your bride? Let me tell you what that'd be. It'd be like me walking down here and say, Clayton, I love you. I love you dearly, brother. You're a brother. I love you. I hate Angie. God, I can't stand that woman. I'm going to tell you, that's fighting words. See, what we're working out here is there was a fight for 180 million last night. I'm just saying. (laughs) What am I telling you in that? I'm telling you that the love of God that abides in me says this. If I love God, I love his people. I can't have a love for God and not love the action of His church, the work of His church, and what we've been called to do. Can I tell you something this morning, church? Are you listening? Say amen. Amen. I love the church. I love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I grew up in the church. I was saved in the church. I was baptized in the church. I was called by God in the church. I was ordained in the church, married in the church, 
have my children dedicated before the Lord in the church. Watch them be saved and baptized in the church. Man, the church has had a major impact in my life. How about yours? There's a major impact of God's love. And I love the church Jesus died for. That Jesus gave his life for. And that is proof and evidence in my life of the change of God's nature. When you're lost, living in the world, you don't have any desire to be in the church. But the love of God compels you to come and to be trained, taught, developed. To grow in the Lord. The church ought to be about God's business when it comes to developing Christians and growing Christians in the love of God and developing me as a believer and sharing the mission of Jesus Christ to use our spiritual gifts. And the church also anchors me in from drifting back out in this world. Thank God for the church. I'll tell you, I love the church of Jesus Christ. Now, we have some flaws. We have some petty things. But it is the church Jesus died for. Amen? And he did call us to belong. He's called us to be a part. And so therefore, seeing God's love in me, it abides in me to love his word, to love the church, but to also love the lost. One of the biggest changes that could ever be made in our life is this aspect. that once we're saved... We want to see other people come to Christ. What compelled that man to carry that other man's stuff, equipment, was the fact that he wanted to see him be saved. He wanted him to know the God who had saved him. He was compelled to the loss in evangelism and missions to become an important part of that man's life was to take that an extra mile and to say to him, I love you because God loves you. Let me tell you something, I love lost people because God loves them. And they need to be saved. No matter what you think, listen to this. There's nothing that matters more to God than a lost soul being saved. The cross proves that. That Jesus would come for us. That he sent his son to be propitiation of our sins. To love the lost. So the word of God teaches me that God is seen in love through the word, through the church, and through lost people coming to Christ. But here's the last thing I want to give you. Notice verses 17 and 18 as he comes to a part of telling us about serving God through love. You know what the Word of God tells us here in this that I love? It tells us this, that love's been perfected, that we don't have to worry about judgment. We've been set free from it. Now, church, I want you to to hear this real clear this morning. I want you to understand, one day I believe that every Christian's going to stand, and we are going to give an account for what we've done since the day we got saved. But let me tell you this. This is a deep conviction. I, I hope you understand this this morning. I do not believe that one day we're going to stand and give an account for our sin because as a believer, my sin was put on Christ at Calvary. He judged my sin there, and I have been freed from sin. And my sin debt is paid in full. If there was something still to answer in that, that that meant not everything was paid for in full. But this is what God has done. He has compelled us to understand that when God judged our sin, that set us free to serve Him, to know Him, to love Him. Just, just like I talked about last week with the man with the talents, five, two, and one. We don't take our talent and hide it because we're afraid that God's still judging our sin. We take that talent that God has given us and use it for His glory because we're free. Because we've been set free this morning. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. We are free to serve. We're not bound up. We're not entangled to this world anymore. We're free to serve God. This morning, hearing those chains fall, that song, knowing those shackles are broken, knowing that we are not chained to sin anymore, that means whom the sun sets free is free indeed. We're not shackled to sin anymore. The sin debt is not on you. It was on Christ. He became propitiation for our sin. God's wrath was satisfied. And He set us free. 
And church, His love is free in us. It compels us to go that second mile. We see in this that we do not have a fear to serve God because God took our judgment. We don't serve out of guilt. We don't serve seeking the approval of others. We serve seeking the approval of God. And we serve and love one another because that is the nature of God living in us. Amen, church? What compels me to go a second mile? The love of God, the nature of God that lives in me now, that teaches me how to love, how to give, how to serve. Without fear. Free. Because I'm set free in Christ. So this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I know of no better day in the world than this day to give your life to Jesus. If you're here today and say, you know what, I need to be a part of a family of God, I know of no greater day to be a part of the family of God. The law compels you to go a mile. The Savior compels you to go a second mile. The nature of God living in you says, let's go a second mile. Let's be the church God called us to be. Every head's bowed. Every eye's closed. Father, I thank you for second milers. I thank you this morning for a church that has been teachable. For a family that's growing in the love of God. For the nature of God that lives in us and compels us to go farther. To see the journey, Jesus, of where you are. Father, I thank you for the church this morning. Thank you for the word of God in our life. Thank you for saving us, forgiving us, adopting us into the family of God. We know God because your love has changed us. Your nature has changed us, God. I'm thankful this morning. I'm thankful for the second mile, Lord. And help us to love one another. Help us to love the lost. Help us to give of ourselves, Lord, because you gave your best for us. We count it all joy and a privilege to serve you. And Father, I thank you for the second mile. Help our church to be a second mile church. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to extend a time of invitation, invite you to come this morning as you stand to your feet. Would you come?